Dr. Kanchi is a very senior faculty member. He is the dean of the he is the dean of the Indian College of Anesthesiologists. The program today is on various areas, actually the arterial, the venous, the pulmonary artery uh, pressures, as well as the cardiac output. And Dr. Murlidhar Kanchi, along with him, Dr. Raghu, Shivananda, and Ravi Naik are going to moderate. So. Thank you, Dr. Jayasri Sweet, for your kind words. I feel proud and privileged to initiate today's uh, discussion on overview of hemodynamic monitoring. And before I do that, I would like to congratulate Dr. Jayashree Sud for having been nominated as one of the top five lady anesthesiologists of the world. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I'm Thank so you. truly humbled by your appreciation. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. So coming to the subject proper, we'll be dealing with the overview of hemodynamic monitoring and uh, we will be starting with basics, but we'll go on to the advanced uh, part of the discussion. And I would like to uh, request uh, and uh, uh, request Dr. Raghu, who is my colleague, consultant, senior consultant in cardiac anesthesia, at Narayan Hudayalaya, Dr. Ravi Nayak, who is again working with us as a senior consultant, and Dr. Shivananda, who is uh, working in Manipal Hospital, Wildfield, to be with us till the end and uh, carry on the session. So I request Dr. Raghu to take over and introduce the first speaker. Dr. Raghu. Uh, good evening, sir. Please Good evening. Please. Now, uh, today we are going to uh, start our session uh, with uh, direct arterial uh, uh, line uh, monitoring. And this is uh, uh, the talk uh, is going to be given by Dr. Uh, Saujanya, who is our final year uh, uh, NBA um, uh, cardiac uh, anesthetist. Saujanya, over to you. Good evening, everyone, sir. Uh, sir, am I audible? Yeah. Okay, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, today, I'm dealing with the topic of direct arterial pressure monitoring. Uh, this was first measured invasively in 1733, sir. From uh, that period, it is undergoing so many modifications to make it more reliable and more feasible. Sir, so what makes uh, invasive blood pressure preferable over our uh, conventional non-invasive blood pressure. So this is for continuous beat-to-beat -beat monitoring of arterial blood pressure. Uh, where, it, where is it indicated? So whenever major surgery is planned, like cardiothoracic, neurosurgical, or in which surgeries where major hemodynamic shifts are uh, predicted, and coming to the patient factors, when uh, there are significant comorbidities, or when non-invasive blood pressure is uh, not reliable, such as in morbidly obese, hypovolemic, septic shock patients, patients in uh, cardiac failure, or uh, burns where NIPP uh, we can't uh, rely on, or where the patients are critically ill. The other indications uh, which we commonly perform invasive blood pressure is when uh, we require frequent blood sampling for point of care tests such as our ABG, hemoglobin, electrolytes, and uh, other tests of hemostasis. So coming to the site selection, we can place both in peripheral arteries and central arteries, depending upon the surgery and uh, the patient factors. If it is a, patient, if it is a peripheral artery, we, we should look for uh, collateral blood flow if it is an end artery. So most commonly cannulated peripheral arteries are radial, brachial, and dorsalis pedis, and central arteries are femoral and axillary. So these are the techniques uh, which we usually follow, uh, separate guide wire technique or uh, with guide wire technique. So when we are about to cannulate a peripheral artery, which is an end artery, we should always check for a collateral blood flow. This is a modified LNS test, which we usually perform when we are about to cannulate a radial artery. So if the modified LNS test is negative, 
that is when the hand will flush within 5 to 15 seconds this indicates that an adequate collateral blood flow from the ulnar artery is there so we can go ahead with cannulating the radial artery but if the modified LN, lns test is positive that is the hand will not flush in within 5 to 15 seconds this indicates inadequate collateral blood flow from the ulnar artery so these are the technical aspects or physical principles underlying the invasive blood pressure. We have patient end uh, to which our arterial cannula is connected with a stiff tubing and we have a stopcock to, stop to zero the line. We have a transducer to which it is attached a flexible diaphragm and a Wheatstone bridge. And we have a line connected to a pressurized saline bag and we have a monitor end which will uh, give us the invasive blood pressure arterial waveform with Fourier analysis. So this is the working principle of all the components of our invasive blood pressure monitoring. Here, what is important is the Wheatstone bridge, which is incorporated in the transducer of the invasive blood pressure. So when the arterial pulsations come and hit the column of the saline in the stiff tubing, this deforms the flexible diaphragm which is present in the transducer. So this distortion of the flexible diaphragm causes a proportional change in the resistance across the Wheatstone bridge. This is uh, acquired by the monitor and it undergoes a Fourier analysis. So basically the arterial waveform which we see in the monitor, it is the sum of harmonic waveforms or sine waves uh, which are simple waveforms with individual frequencies. The sum of uh, six to eight waveforms will give a complex invasive blood pressure waveform, which we see on the monitor. So basically it is a summation waveform. So this is the normal arterial waveform. This has an anachrotic limb, which indicates the blood ejection from the left ventricle to the iota and we have a systolic peak, which is the highest point of the anachrotic limb. This gives the systolic blood pressure uh, recording and the diacrotic limb, the diacrotic notch, which indicates the, uh, the closure of the aortic wall and the end diastolic pressure, which is the lowest point of the diacrotic limb. This gives the diastolic blood pressure. So uh, this slide indicates the arterial waveform in comparison to the ECG. Here we can find a slight delay in the waveform uptake when compared to the peak of R wave. This delay usually occurs from the actual ventricular depolarization, blood ejection from the LV to the iota and the signal reaching the transducer. So uh, this indicates the area under the normal invasive blood pressure waveform. The area under the systolic uh, curve that is the anachrotic limb up to the dichrotic notch gives us the systolic area and the area under the dichrotic limb gives us the diastolic area. So the systolic blood pressure is the highest point of the arterial waveform and the diastolic blood pressure is the lowest point. So the difference between the systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure gives us the pulse pressure and the mean arterial blood pressure is calculated. So uh, we can also come we can also give an, a rough idea of the preload contractility and afterload of the heart from this arterial waveform counter. Uh, the systolic area is related to the preload and contractility of the myocardium. The diastolic area accounts for afterload, whereas the compliance of the arterial system is, invasive, is inversely proportional to the mean arterial blood pressure. This slide indicates the various uh, variations of the arterial waveform, which we uh, come across in our routine practice. So in the first, in the topmost graph, uh, the, when the stroke volume increases, which is indicated by the blue waveform, uh, mainly uh, your area under curve of both systolic and diastolic area will increase and the curve will shift towards up and right. When there is decreased in the stroke volume, the curve will shift towards downwards and uh, towards downwards of the baseline. So the total area under the arterial waveform curve will decrease 
when your stroke volume is decreasing. And coming to the systemic vascular resistance, Systemic vascular resistance is more of an indicator of afterload of the arterial system. So if the systemic vascular resistance is increasing as indicated by the blue waveform, the, there is a shallow uh, depression in the dichrotic limb. But whereas if the systemic vascular resistance is low, as seen in the vasodilated patients or septic shock pa patients, there is a steep uh, decline in the dichrotic limb. This is another uh, slide indicating a balanced situation of the arterial waveform with forward wave uh, and a reflection of a backward wave in a normal arterial uh, vascular resistant cases. But if the patient is markedly vasodilated, there is a downward shift of the dichrotic notch and, is, and there is a sharp decline in the downstroke of the dichrotic limb, which is depicted in the second waveform. And if there is an increased vascular resistance, like in increased afterload conditions, there is a shallow decline in the downslope, which indicates high SVR or vasoconstricted states. So coming to the physical principles of our uh, monitoring, uh, there are three principles to optimize so that uh, the arterial pressure waveform which we recorded should be reliable. These are natural frequency, damping coefficient and dynamic response of the system. The natural frequency should be always more than the normal frequency of the arterial waveform so that the, the arterial blood pressure which we record is reliable. So the dynamic response should be adequate and the dynamic response of the system is dependent upon the two uh, indicators that is natural frequency and the damping coefficient. If the system is over dampened or if the system is under dampened, there will be either overestimation or under, underestimation of the systolic blood pressure and the pulse pressure. So this is an example of over dampened arterial blood pressure waveform, where we can see there is underestimation of systolic arterial blood pressure, overestimation of diastolic arterial blood pressure, and there is an absent dichrotic notch. So this results in a narrow uh, pulse pressure. This we can come across if there, are, if there are any air bubbles in the stiff tubings or there is any loose connections of the stop box in our transducer system. This is an example of under dampened arterial blood pressure waveform, which when compared to the normal arterial waveform in red. So the under dampened arterial blood pressure waveform will overestimate the systolic pressure, underestimate the diastolic pressure. This results in an wide pulse pressure variation. And we can see many non-physiological oscillations in the dichrotic limb. So uh, coming to the leveling and zeroing of the system, we should, we should always level the transducer system with respect to the appropriate level at which uh, we, we have to establish the zero point. So zeroing refers to the uh, leveling of the system uh, to the ambient atmospheric pressure. So this is usually five centimeters posterior to, posterior to the sternal border or the mid thoracic level. So these are the causes of over dampened waveforms and under dampened waveforms. If there are any air bubbles, loose connections, clots or lower flush back pressure will give you an over dampened waveform or Likewise, if there is any stiff, stiff tubings, long tubings or increased systemic vascular resistance will give rise to under dampened waveform. So there is a simple bedside test to determine the dynamic response of the system, whether it is adequate or not. This is otherwise called as fast flush test. So following a brief flush of the system, we will observe the oscillations of the system over the graph. So when we call when we call the system as uh, optimal is there should be no more than two oscillations and the amplitude of each oscillation should be no greater than one third of the previous oscillation. Then we call it as a normal dampened uh, system and the time interval between two oscillations should be less than 30 milliseconds. This then we can call the uh, system has good natural frequency. 
here we can see if the if the system is over dampened the system will completely fail you fail to oscillate following a flush test and if the system is under dampened we will see a multiple oscill oscillations following a flush test this is another concept of distal arterial pulse uh, amplification so as we trace the arterial waveform from the aorta to peripheral arteries we can see there is a change in the waveform contour taller will be the systolic peak farther will be the diaglottic notch lower will be the end diastolic pressure and wider will be the pulse pressure but the main arterial pressure pressure doesn't change very much it only changes at the level of arterioles where our resistance will change so uh, the one of the most Im important advantage of arterial waveform analysis is it is one of the dynamic indicators of the fluid responsiveness that is pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation so when the patient is mechanically ventilated uh, with the variation with expiration and inspiration there is change in the preload and uh, this will change uh, the blood pressure variation so if the pulse pressure variation is more than uh, 12 to 13 12 to more than or equal to 12 to 13 then we can say that uh, the patient is fluid responsive or fluid depleted and he will be responsive to the fluid bolus likewise we can go for a stroke volume variation also so the pulse pressure variation we measure the pulse pressure uh, maximum pulse pressure minus minimum pulse pressure by mean likewise for stroke volume variation we will measure maximum stroke volume by minimum stroke volume by mean so this is one of the dynamic indicator of volume responsiveness here as we can see as the preload increases lower will be the respiratory variation of the pulse pressure and the stroke volume so the patient will not be volume responsive as we can see at the uh, topmost part of the graph but uh, as we can see towards the left of the graph uh, as the preload is low there will be a higher respiratory variation of pulse pressure and stroke volume so the patient is highly fluid responsive uh, this is the other advantage of pulse pressure uh, arterial waveform counter here we can see the normal arterial plus, pulse but in various other disease uh, uh, states we can uh, we can see the signature curves of the arterial counter here we can see pulses on alterance where we see the difference in the systolic pressure between two beats here we can see the patient is in heart failure and pulses difference where we can see a double beating pulse with two systolic peaks this is commonly seen in aortic regurgitation or high output states and pulses paradoxicus which is an exaggerated decline in the pulse in the blood pressure during inspiration which results in a negative intrathoracic pressure. This can be usually seen in the cardiac tamponade or constrictive pericarditis or severe lung, lung disease. So uh, by visualizing simple the arterial waveform, we can uh, get an idea of the underlying disease condition of the patient. So this is a brief uh, outline of the arterial uh, blood pressure waveform and its uh, advantages over a non-invasive blood pressure monitoring. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sojanya. Go to the next. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ravi, introduce the speaker. Uh, uh, Raghu, I am going to introduce uh, the next speaker. Mm. Is uh, Sushrita Sahu. She is doing her uh, final uh, DNB fellowship in uh, cardiac. Sojanya, please uh, unshare the screen. Yes. Uh, she is doing a uh, final year DNB fellowship in cardiac anesthesia at Narayana Hrudayalaya. She is going to speak on uh, central venous pressure. Now over to Sushrita. Uh, I'll be thanking to ICA for giving me opportunity to uh, present on this topic, central venous pressure. So before coming to central venous pressure, it is what, what is uh, central venous pressure? It is a pressure measured from the tip of central venous catheter kept in a big central vein like internal jugular vein or femoral vein or subclavian vein. So first central venous cannulation was done by Werner Froschmann into an antiguatal vein, which is, unlike, uh, un, uh, which is unlike to the concept of central venous catheter insertion. So where to measure CVP accurately? 
for that stop cock of transducer to be placed at a point 5 cm below the sternal angle according to miller's analysis of textbook as opposed to the conventional plavot axis axis which exist in the mid thoracic area uh, at the midpoint of anterior posterior diameter of thorax in fourth intercostal space and it has to be measured at end expiration so before coming to central venous pressure uh, one article published uh, by dr uh, k murlidhar sir in jo journal cardiothoracic vascular anesthesia the right jugular vein is preferred than left jugular vein because it has a straight course and pleural dome is lower on the right side and there is no risk to thoracic duct injury then coming to another article published by manashwini kesha vetal they found a internal jugular vein access is best done either during expiration in an awake patient in trendelenburg position or inspiration during control ventilation in an anesthetized patient in trendelenburg position as the dimensions were the largest in this positions then coming to physiologic consideration of cvp actually it replicates right atrial pressure or indirectly estimate right ventricular feeling pressure so as opposed to we what we say cvp indicates volume status actually it indicates venous return to the venous return to the heart so coming uh, so two corollaries comes up to that central venous pressure and venous return so what is venous return it is the gradient between mean systemic feeling pressure and central venous pressure so if cvp is high so venous return will be low so that can be extrapolated to x and y axis here we can see as the right atrial pressure is decreasing venous return is increasing but below zero right atrial pressure venous return is becoming plateau it is hypothesized hypothesized below zero pressure because of high relative extramural pressure there will be no venous return to the right atrium so venous return becomes a plateau so coming to second corollary central venous pressure in cardiac output this is according to frank stanley law venous return or cardiac output indirectly that increases proportionately with right atrial pressure or preloading to the right atrium but up to a physiological limit that is a limit of cardiac accommodation after which cardiac output becomes plateau so here we can see different operational characteristics of different venous return overlapping a cardiac output or frank stallen curve so here are the steady state operating points shifts upward with increasing the preload but in the in the steep portion of the frank stallen curve then this is the operational characteristic of dip, a different cardiac output of frank stallen curve here the steady state operating point shifts with increasing contractility or increasing cardiac output then coming to normal central venous pressure press which coincided uh, and which is coinciding with ecg dress so in cvp we can see three peaks a c and v and two troughs x and y a comes right before r wave r wave of ecg comes and which denotes atrial contraction and then comes the c wave that happens during isovolumetric ventricular contraction which which causes right uh which causes tricuspid valve to be pulled upward into the right atrium then comes the x wave which is because of a uh, ventricular ejection which causes right uh, tricuspid valve to push into the right ventricle and this is called a systolic collapse of central venous pressure then comes the v wave v wave occurs when atrium gets emptied into the ventricle and x then comes the y wave y descent that occurs during uh that occurs during when uh tricuspid valve opens up and gets emptied into the ventricle so this is called as diastolic collapse 
then coming to abnormal cardiac pathology which cvp can show us so in atrial fibrillation there will be no a wave but a big c wave with v and y f being normal then comes to av dissociation which shows a canon a wave in the left panel of the screen then coming to ventricular pacing which is very much similar to av dissociation a big systolic a wave we can see and which becomes a normal wave form in case of av sequential pacing then coming to tricuspid regurgitation where c and v wave coalesce with a obliteration of x wave then coming to tricuspid stenosis where y descent becomes obliterated followed by a big a wave then comes to pericardial constriction where a and b v waves be becomes bigger with steeper x and y descent then comes to cardiac tamponade here a and v wave becomes a and v wave becomes big with y descent becomes obliterated so coming to implic implications of cvp and current days practice so in a original article in elsevier published by jiafang u et al they found out sequential fluid therapy based on central venous pressure did not reduce incidence of organ dysfunction therefore maintaining cvp at an intermediate value will be a better option then many trials has been done based on cvp targeted um, fluid therapy so uh, one of this is reverse trial they found out patients with sepsis or septic shock showed a mortality benefit to protocol based early goal directed therapy based on cvp monitoring but rest of the trial like process trial ri trial they didn't found out, they didn't find out any benefit to protocol based resuscitation based on cvp then coming to a meta trial meta analysis done by marik et al and 2013 they found that cvp measurement is not an effective marker of fluid responsiveness so cannot be relied upon for guidance uh, of fluid administration then coming to d becker uh, and vincent they have answered to 10 questions in a open access view point so coming to question 1 are the factors that influence cvp too numerous to make it meaningful yes cvp is affected by thoracic pericardial and abdominal pressures hence won't reflect true loading conditions of right ventricle in these conditions then coming to question 2 can a given cvp value determine whether a patient is fluid responsive cvp has a limited value because there is a wide interpatient variability in the slope extreme cvp values can help to guide the response to fluids whereas intermediate values will not so coming to question 3 can changes in cvp during fluid administration be used as an indication of the response to fluids yes but changes in cvp during fluid challenge must be analyzed together with changes in cardiac output or, or other indices can cvp be used as a safety variable cvp can be a excellent variable to estimate the risk associated with extra thoracic organ congestion but it fails to reflect the risk of developing pulmonary edema coming to question number 5 is there a safe cvp value actually data first determine the upper limit of cvp on an individual basis weighing the potential benefit risk for the fluid administration then only cvp will be a, will be a safety characteristics to guide fluid therapy then coming to question number 6 should fluids be administered to reach predefined cvp value according to reverse trial target cvp values of 8 to 12 mm of hg can be kept for fluid administration but this is questionable then coming to uh, question number 7 are cvp measurements reliable enough are there too, not too many technical problems yeah errors are there which is which is related to both positioning of 
zero level as well as reading errors and which needs a bigger expertise skills. Then coming to question number eight, are measurements of end diastolic volumes not preferable as intraventricular volumes better reflect preload than pressures? Actually, volumes better predict fluid responsiveness on the steep part of Frank Stalin relationship, but on the plateau, pressures should be indicated better than that patient has reached the limits of feeling. Then question number nine, are dynamic indices of fluid responsiveness better for guiding fluid administration? Dynamic indices of fluid responsiveness, such as pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation, or changes in cardiac output during a passive leg raise, they better reflect the heart is an ascending part of the Starling relationship. And CPP is a static indices of fluid responsiveness. So if high CVP, it reflects the high risk with fluid administration and likelihood of further increasing capillary and edema and congestion formation. Should we try to decrease CVP in some conditions? As elevated CVP levels may be associated with organ dysfunction, one, one should try to maintain CVP as low as possible, but only applied once initial hemodynamic stabilization or resuscitation has been done. So to conclude this session, CPP, CVP values provide important information about the cardiothoracic status of the patient and should not be abandoned. And use of CVP to guide fluid resuscitation has many limitations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sushruta, for a nice presentation. Now, uh, Thank you, sir. Now over to Ravi for the next The next topic is uh, pulmonary artery pressure uh, monitoring. Uh, it will be presented by Dr. Nishant. He is our IACTA fellow in Narayan Tridalia. Dr. Nishant, you can carry on. Pulmonary artery pressure, a pulmonary artery is a low pressure, highly elastic system of blood vessels made up of thin walled, less muscular structures compared to the systemic vessels. The birth of the pulmonary artery catheter was announced in the New England Journal of um, Medicine in 1970 by Swan and Gans. The pulmonary artery catheter uh, use grew rapidly until 1968 in the US when it was shown to influence the management of over 40% of ICO patients. It was impressive to observe large changes in the pulmonary artery pressure and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure with almost no reflection in the central venous pressure. In 1983, it was Connors uh, et al. who found that less than half of a group of clinicians correctly predicted the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or cardiac output more than 50% made at least one change in the therapy based on the pulmonary artery catheter data. In the same year, Valer and Kaplan uh, demonstrated that a group of experienced cardiologists and surgeons who were blinded to the information from pulmonary artery catheter were unaware of the problems during 65% of severe hemodynamic abnormalities. Similarly, Iberti and Fisher showed 60% of ICU physicians made at least one change in the therapy and 33% changed their diagnosis based on the pulmonary artery catheter data or PAC data. Thus, the introduction of flow-directed uh, pulmonary artery catheter was a quantum advance in the monitoring of patients in the perioperative period during the 1970s and 80s. The right IJV approach remains the technique of choice because of the direct path between the vessel and the right atrium. However, um, uh, clinicians have uh, tried out um, subclavian approach, but during sternotomy, uh, around 44% of the catheters were kinked, rendering them permanently non-functional. In 1970, Swan and Gans, uh, uh, this is the original uh, catheter uh, uh, devised by Swan and Gans. It is thin, that is 1.7 millimeters of five French with only two lumen. In this picture, there is a cross section of the catheter demonstrating a larger lumen for the pressure management and a smaller lumen for balloon inflation. The balloon had a volume of 0.8 ml as compared to 1.5 ml in the modern era. And as we can see, there is no facility to administer any injected or measure the temperature. 
pulmonary artery catheter so 50 years after its invention now we have a modern pulmonary artery catheter with multiple functions it is mri safe flexible flow directed balloon tipped catheter available in adult and pediatric sizes uh, ranging from 16 cm to 110 cm in length and between 4 french to 7.5 french in caliber with a balloon inflating volume ranging between 0.5 ml to 1.5 ml the material used is polyvinyl chloride which softens at body temperature and individual parts are, will be discussed in the in the subsequent slides this is the tip of the pulmonary artery catheter uh, which is used to transduce pa pressure and collect blood sample the tip in this particular catheter also features an optical sensor for continuous uh, mixed venous saturation this is a balloon just distilled to the tip the inflating volume is 1.5 ml with a max with a diameter of 13 mm however this volume is a characteristic of the syringe that is used to inflate the balloon the uh, plunge uh, the syringe the cylinder of the syringe um, has um, um the syringe of the uh, syringe has plastic nubs which will prevent the descent of the plunger beyond 1.5 mm this is the thermistor uh, which is usually uh, situated 4 cm from the distal end it is hardly visible uh, because it is embedded in the pulmon uh, in the polyvinyl chloride material to prevent short circuits and intracardiac microcurrents it is a resistor which has a maximum sensitivity between 30 to 40 degrees celsius and uh, it measures the change in the pulmonary artery blood as it moves passes past the catheter next in the line are uh, markers uh, a small marker uh, denotes a distance of 10 cm whereas a thick black line will denote a distance of um, 50 cm this is to allow the operator assess the depth of insertion and manipulate it intraoperatively the catheter is covered with a plastic seal which is transparent and it has a locking mechanism uh, after insertion the uh, sheath Uh, the main function of the sheath is to provide uh, uh, to maintain sterility of the part that is exposed to the environment at the same time the transparency will allow us to assess the depth of insertion uh, this is a thermal filament which is coiled it starts at approximately 15 cm and ends up to 25 cm from the distal end this is the thermo element of the continuous thermodilution catheter and for safety purpose its heating is limited to a maximum temperature of 44 degrees celsius there may be one injected port if present at uh, 26 cm or there may be two injection ports in the pulmonary catheter the second would be present at 30 cm at the level of the right atrium it can be used uh, to inject uh, the injected or start some infusion the hub of the pa catheter separates the lumen and other connectors in a sort of a corda equina like fashion it is made up of multi colored tubes which is a safety feature the important feature in here includes the color coding of the lumen and special locking mechanism which permits the tip of the balloon to stay inflated the balloon lumen is red injected lumen is blue and distal pulmonary artery lumen is yellow the initial steps of pulmonary catheter insertion are similar to what the previous speaker has told us after passage of the pulmonary catheter from the vessel introducer into the pulmonary uh, to the pulmonary uh, to the pulm uh, pulmonary artery this can be accomplished by monitoring the waveforms as you can see in the screen or by fluoroscopic guidance first the catheter must be advanced through the vessel introducer to up to 15 to 20 cm before inflating the balloon and the inflation inflated balloon will facilitate the further advancement of the catheter from the ra to the rv pa and the uh, uh, capillary wedge uh, as we enter the ra uh, we get a cvp a cvp waveform which is discussed by the previous speaker it will usually range between 1 to 6 mm but this is in the normal individual 
as we advanced further the right ventricle as we descend through the tricuspid valve there is a rise in the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure will remain the same as the ventricle is filled from the uh, uh, right ventricle is filled from the right atrium if we have a pacing uh, catheter or a pace porter catheter we can monitor the right ventricular pressure continuously as we can see in the second picture in this picture this is uh, this uh, flat line represents the right ventricular uh, diastole which is a measure of the compliance of the right ventricle with onset of right ventricular dysfunction the compliance reduces and hence its ability to accumulate volume will reduce thus the diastolic curve will become more oblique uh, uh, that is uh, it will increase by around 4 mm of mercury with further advancement of diastolic dysfunction there is a square root sign which appears on the pressure wave form as the right ventricular function further deteriorates the diastolic gradient between the um, right ventricle and the pulmonary artery as shown by the arrow will gradually reduce to equalize in the late stages of right ventricular systolic dysfunction there and diastolic dysfunction the uh, amplitude of the graph will reduce that is um, the change in pressure per unit change in time uh, would be reduced this will be associated with pulses tardus and uh, in addition uh, there will be presence of Uh, square root sign and diastolic pressure equalization if we advance the catheter further past the pulmonary valve one can see a pulmonary wave form which resembles the wave form of any other artery at this stage diastolic pressure will rise to 6 to 12 mm of mercury this is due to the flow resistance in the pulmonary arterial network this is the fabled pa diastolic pressure that is the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure which maintains a supposedly stable and reliable relationship with the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure the artery which is uh, uh, inflated will uh, further advanced will reach a uh, wave form uh, the pulmonary wave artery wave form will disappear and a venous looking wave form will appear this indicates that the pulmonary artery is occluded once we have found this wedging point the balloon has to be deflated and the catheter is to be fixed at this position the balloon must be inflated only for a short period of time pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is a surrogate marker of left atrial pressure and left ventricular uh, diastolic pressure it also gives us an estimate of the degree of mitral stenosis we can differentiate cardiogenic edema in which pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be more than 15 mm of mercury from non cardiogenic pulmonary edema um during insertion of the pulmonary artery catheter it can get stuck in any of the chambers or it can enter the coronary sinus the balloon can get deflated there can be arrhythmias or complete heart block in this presentation we will see trouble shooting during insertion using a trans esophageal echocardiography the first view is a modified mid esophageal bicaval view the catheter is shown in red color it is uh, in the area of the coronary sinus if we give a counter if we give a clockwise torque uh, it will get directed to the tricuspid valve in this image that uh, image is developed at 90 degree and hence a clockwise torque will produce anti clockwise turn in the catheter on the image a mid esophageal modified bicaval view the catheter indicated in red color is stuck in the right atrial appendage Uh, we should give a counter clockwise uh, torque to direct it to the tricuspid valve the same uh, image uh, a third image shows um, a pulmonary artery catheter marked by the red arrow trapped in the right atrial appendage this is a mid esophageal right ventricular inflow outflow view in diastole a catheter in the red circle is visualized abutting the free wall of the right ventricle we should give a counter clockwise traction to direct it to the outflow and pulmonic valve now this is a mid esophageal um, uh, this is a mid esophageal uh, right ventricular inflow outflow view in diastole here the pac catheter is seen traversing uh, in the right ventricle with the red arrow and the balloon is marked with the white arrow which is clearly visualized 
This is an ascending aorta, short axis view. And the pulmonary artery's final position can be confirmed in the main pulmonary artery uh, or a proximal branch. Transesophageal echocardiography potentially can decrease the incidence. Uh, here we can see it in the right pulmonary artery. Uh, using TE, we can decrease the incidence of arrhythmia that is induced by migration of catheter into the right ventricular outflow or we can minimize the damage to the pulmonary circulation by optimizing the depth of insertion. This is the ascending aorta short axis view uh, where the uh, PAC balloon which is shown in the red arrow is visualized in the proximal right pulmonary artery. It can additionally be checked by uh, uh, chest x-ray. Traditionally, it was checked with a chest x-ray where uh, the catheter tip can be visualized in the right pulmonary artery or the left pulmonary artery within five centimeters from the midline, not more than two centimeters from the hilum. Absolute contraindications include tricuspid stenosis, RVOT obstruction, RA mass, and tetralogy of phallet. Relative contraindications include coagulopathy, arrhythmias, recent pacemaker insertion. I have enlisted the list of complications, arrhythmias being most common, but in interest of time, uh, we will move to further slides. Cardiac output monitoring uh, using PSE catheter is by thermodilution technique would be discussed in detail by the next speaker. Intermittent thermodilution technique is most commonly used and is gold standard, which is which uses Stuart Hamilton equation. The PAC, even though it was uh, the PAC was uh, useful to measure the intracardiac pressures to measure cardiac output, uh, uh, and it had better correlation with the left-sided heart pressures, unlike the CVP. Additionally, it also helped us derive multiple hemodynamic and oxygenation related parameters. Hence, its use was increasing in the 1970s and 80s. But in 1996, Connors published a large prospective cohort study after including over 5,700 uh, 5, patients from five different tertiary care institutes who had undergone right heart catheterization. They observed that PAC insertion was associated with increased length of hospital stay, increased mortality, and increment in the associated cost of treatment in this population. In the wake of this publication, there were increasing evidences from further studies. Most of them confirmed those findings uh, and the use of pulmonary artery catheter in the United States started decreasing. Between 93 and 2004, the PAC use in United States reduced by 65% for all medical admissions. Uh, uh, Leibowitz and uh, Orapello published a data on pulmonary artery catheter used in patients admitted to the surgical ICU after studying 600 patients per year for six years. The number of PACs inserted decreased significantly from 23% in the year 2000 to less than 2% in the year 2006. However, in the graph, we can note that even the mortality has slightly reduced. However, there were serious lacunas in the literature that was published. All the patients were included in the study were admitted in the intensive care unit. There were flaws in the study design in the form of lack of treatment protocols and treatment algorithms inadequate randomization, insufficient statistical power, and data interpretation. Eligibility criteria had a tendency to focus on the patients that were critically ill, but not on the patients in whom hemodynamic monitoring was thought to have a particular value. The age of the patients, uh, most of the patients were more than 65 years of age with heterogeneous population, which made a subgroup analysis uh, uh, difficult. An Indian questionnaire-based study conducted by Dr. Murlidhar Kanchi involved over 100 cardiac anesthesiologists across the country, conducting over 500 cases in one year. They observed that 83% of the cardiac anesthesiologists used pulmonary artery catheter in certain subset of patients without increase in the mortality attributed to the pulmonary artery catheter. Several other studies were published in due course, which advocated the use of pulmonary artery catheter in operating room for selected cases to monitor pressure changes. 
unlike the icu pac is most often inserted prior to physiological deterioration in the cardiac operation theater and patients are managed proactively to present, uh, prevent any deterioration the operating in the operating room a physician is constantly present to monitor the hemodynamic status whereas in the intensive care unit the uh, uh, and uh, the nurse manages the patients at bedside if one would like to choose a vasoconstrictor against a dilator it would be uh, difficult to guess without proper knowledge of the systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance the thermodilution technique to measure cardiac output monitoring is gold standard and uh, the mixed venous saturation is recommended by sepsis uh, 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 is recommended in the sepsis guideline uh, also with the use of pulmonary artery catheter there was significant reduction in the requirement of blood transfusion because of all these reasons the american society of anesthesiologists have published a guideline in 2010 to you for the use of pulmonary artery catheter uh, any hemodynamic instability of unknown etiology is uh, one of the main indications to use pulmonary artery catheter however it should be uh, decided on the patient surgery and practice related settings pulmonary artery catheter must be used in presence of significant organ dysfunction in asa 4 and 5 patients also pulmonary artery catheter uh, should not be used uh, if the clinician nursing staff or the practice uh, settings are not competent in safe insertion accurate interpretation and appropriate maintenance of the catheter routine pa insertion is not recommended when the patient procedure uh, involves low or moderate risk of hemodynamic changes even though the use of pulmonary artery catheter cannot be recommended as a matter of routine a definite rule is suggested in selected group of patients undergoing cardiac surgery as stated by pinky and vincent let us use the pulmonary artery catheter correctly and only when we need it thank you thank you nishant dr raghu please introduce the next speaker the next speaker is uh, uh, mrs uh, madhu nishant who is a first year uh, iacta fellowship candidate she is going to talk on cardiac output monitor over to you madhu A very good afternoon to uh, respected faculty and all my dear participants. Firstly, I would like to thank Dr. Mulidhar Kanchi sir for giving me an opportunity. So let's move on to the topic cardiac output monitoring. Coming to the history of cardiac output, it was way back in 1817. Scientist Adolf Fick first developed the technique for measuring cardiac output. Researchers have spent years studying cardiac output and its application in improving patients' care. as we all know cardiac output it is the volume of blood pumped out by each ventricle per minute it is the product of heart rate and stroke volume but the fundamental question is why do we measure it cardiac output is a principal determinant of tissue perfusion and adequate oxygen delivery so let's see the indications of cardiac output monitoring it can be divided into diagnostic and therapeutic indications diagnostic to assess the myocardial function in low and high cardiac output states therapeutic to monitor in presence of inotropes or vasodilators and to measure oxygen delivery traditionally we used to estimate cardiac output using the clinical signs as shown in the slide but these are poor indicators of cardiac output so the techniques of cardiac output monitoring are now classified into two ways firstly based on the degree of invasive procedures required to obtain necessary information as invasive minimally invasive less invasive and non invasive techniques next based on the physiological principle used to derive necessary information as shown in the slide today in interest of time we will try to quickly go through these techniques one by one using the pulmonary artery catheter as described by the previous speaker measurement of cardiac output is either continuous or intermittent which is gold standard we will see these important principles of cardiac output in measurement in relation to the pulmonary artery catheter one by one fixed principle 
if we have to measure the oxygen consumed by an organ it is simply oxygen entering the organ minus oxygen coming out of the organ using this principle fix calculated cardiac output as oxygen consumption divided by arterial and venous oxygen difference next is intermittent thermodilution technique Thermodilution technique adopts the indicator dilution principle and inject it of known volume, usually 10 mL, and temperature is inject injected into the RA in two to four seconds. The cold blood is sensed by the thermistor in a measure vessel downstream using the Stewart-Hamilton equation. The algorithm measures the area under the TD curve till it reaches an exponential decay of 30 percent to derive the cardiac output. Next is continuous thermodilution cardiac output technique. Continuous thermodilution technique uses a specialized PA catheter with a 10 cm thermal filament incorporated into RV portion of PAC approximately 15 to 25 cm from the catheter tip. The filament generates a low energy heat impulse that are transmitted to the surrounding blood and resulting temperature change is measured by the thermistor at the pulmonary artery catheter tip the thermodilution temperature curve is plotted and the displayed value of cardiac output is updated every 30 to 60 seconds these are the catheters which we use for intermittent and continuous thermodilution techniques pulse contour analysis is a technique of measuring and monitoring stroke volume on a beat to beat basis from arterial pressure waveform Pulse contour analysis is an integral component in measurement of cardiac output. Flow track it works on the principle of pulse contour analysis. This system utilizes an existing radial or a femoral arterial line that is attached to its monitoring unit to determine the flow by pressure gradient across the blood vessel and resistance to that flow. This system provides a comprehensive hemodynamic data including cardiac output, cardiac index, systemic vascular resistance, stroke volume and stroke volume variation. The pulse index continuous cardiac out output monitor that is PICO utilizes principle of thermodilution and pulse contour analysis. It requires a specific PICO pressure transducer validated for optimized pulse contour analysis. This favors a continuous monitoring of cardiac output. Lidco. It is based on principle of indicator dye dilution technique. A small dose of lithium chloride, that is 0.15 to 0.3 millimoles, is injected via central or a peripheral line, resulting in an arterial lithium co concentration time curve recorded by withdrawing blood past a lithium sensor. that is attached to patient's existing arterial line the lithium indicator dilution washout curve on the lidco monitor provides an accurate absolute cardiac output value this method must be avoided in patients receiving lithium therapy pregnancy breastfeeding and weight less than 40 kg next method is a non invasive method it is an esophageal doppler which is based on principle of doppler shift In this technique, a small esophageal probe is inserted into the esophagus to measure the velocity of blood using Doppler effect. The velocity of blood, distance of blood which travels in one minute, and cross-sectional area through the blood vessel will help us to derive the cardiac output. Nico used a method known as partial carbon dioxide rebreathing. technique which is based on fixed principle indirect fixed principle with this method cardiac output is proportional to change in co2 elimination divided by resulting end tidal carbon dioxide these changes are measured by nico sensor which periodically adds a rebreathing volume into the breathing circuit it is automated continuous method of cardiac output monitoring using a trans thoracic echocardiography a non invasive technique we can measure this step 1 is to get a parasternal long axis view step 2 is to measure the lvot diameter step 3 is to get an apical five chamber view place the pulse wave doppler gate at the lvot vti 
Step five is to trace the LVOT VTI, and then we calculate cardiac output using the formula LVOT area into LVOT VTI into heart rate. This is an absolute non-invasive method. Next is thoracic bio electrical bioimpedance technique developed by NASA and William Cubitt in nineteen sixty six to measure cardiac performance in astronauts. Four dual sensors with eight lead wires placed on the neck and chest. The high frequency, low amplitude currents are transmitted through the blood filled vessels as they offer least resistance, and baseline impedance signal is measured. Subsequently, changes in imp impedance is measured with each heartbeat, blood pressure, velocity change in the aorta. These baseline changes are used to derive hemodynamic parameters. in non invasive continuous cardiac output monitoring we will discuss finger cuff method and automated radial rt ablation tonometry clear sight system is now we see this video non invasive finger, finger cuff, cuff method pressure controller heart reference sensor and hemodynamic monitor the system provides real time continuous beat to beat blood pressure cardiac output stroke volume stroke volume variation and systemic vascular resistance blood pressure or sight finger cuff along with its infrared sensing technology measures blood pressure's variation over time and displays the resulting arterial waveform the inflatable finger cuff measures the diameter of the finger artery with an in, uh, integrated infrared tra uh, transmission plethysmograph this leads to a high a uh, frequent adjust of cuff pressure to keep the blood volume in the finger artery constant throughout the cardiac cycle from the pressure adjustment needed to maintain a constant blood volume in the finger artery the arterial blood pressure waveform can be derived and analyzed to estimate the arterial blood pressure and cardiac output pulse wave transit time can be quantified by measuring the time between the peak of r wave in the electrocardiogram shown by a green line until beginning of pulse wave in the periphery that is an orange line cardiac output can be estimated assuming an inverse relationship between the pulse wave transit time and the stroke volume so here i conclude choice of technique to be used is usually influenced by patient factor operator preference and institutional protocol we need to choose a technique to mo monitor cardiac output keeping these factors in mind thank you sir thank you madhu nice presentation over to shivanand uh okay next speaker is uh, uh, dr arjun alwa he is a director and in charge of uh, icu at narayana hrudaya he is going to speak on echocardiography for uh, hemodynamic monitoring over to arjun uh good evening everybody and thank you very much for providing this opportunity again um so let me quickly get into the next slide that's me uh, i don't have any disclosures uh so echocardiography in 19 uh, 1950s um dr ike inch adler and uh, carl hertz uh, these were the two pioneers who um, initially started using the cardiac ultrasound and uh, they uh, they introduced it uh, to, to the world um initially uh, dr adler started using this technique uh, primarily in diagnose he was a, he was a norwegian uh, um, uh, uh, cardiologist who started using this technique primarily to, for the perioperative study of mitral mitral uh, valves uh, and they both of them uh, adler and hertz in 1970s also were awarded um, uh, one of the premier uh, awards for their uh, uh, for for their introduction introduction into the echocardiography to the world uh, these were the echocardiography instruments that were used Uh, for identifying the m modes and um, uh, uh, the the lower one was the transducer that was uh, that provided an electronic linear scan and represented the first real time 2d um, echocardiographic system we have come a, a very far 
far away currently uh, where we are using pocket ultrasound machines, um, uh, handheld ultrasound machines, which are connected to our uh, mobile phones. Uh, and uh, uh, we are, uh, uh, the ultrasound is in everybody's hand now. We, we are not far away from a time where even the medical students would start using the ultrasound machines as a replacement for, for the stethoscopes. Um, about 25% of the critically ill, mechanically ventilated patients uh, do a lot of therapeutic changes because of, because of the use of transthoracic or uh, transesophageal echocardiographies. Um, the usage in the operation theater, as previously mentioned, um, uh, it brings in a big impact uh, on the on the care of the patients um, in hemodynamic monitoring in the operation theaters in patients undergoing cardiac surgeries. Um, there has been multiple guidelines as well uh, in, in the American Society of uh, Echocardiography, uh, which uh, uh, dis describes the guidelines for the use of echocardiography in monitoring in cardiac cardiac monitoring, so I would, uh, I would request all the all the residents who are there on the um, on the floor to make sure that they read these guidelines, which might help them in in uh, better usage of echocardiography in monitoring. Uh, as you all know, the role of echocardiography monitoring helps in guiding the management of pulmonary embolisms, pericardial effusions, uh, prosthetic va uh, valves, acute heart failure, uh, um, etc. What is the advantage? We've, we've been uh, last one hour, uh, one hour, 15 minutes, we've been talking about most of the invasive monitoring. So uh, the, the echocardiography um, is one of the non-invasive cardiac monitoring that we have. Um, and uh, with practice, it needs practice, you know, uh, it needs a lot of practice. It, it needs, we also uh, conduct, a, it needs a lot of competency. So we need to make sure people attend the workshops, and have hands-on experience on, on the echocardiography so that they can get clear images uh, uh, so that uh, it, can, they can, it can help them in, in, in the operation theater or the emergency room or in the intensive care unit. They're quite portable as well. The echocardiography machines are very portable and can be transferred from one place to another. Although one of the most important disadvantages is uh, it is user dependent, so uh, each individuals can have different values uh, based on their based on their expertise and uh, based on their experience. Uh, the indications of echocardiography can be for diagnostic purposes, for guiding interventions, and also for monitoring and follow up um, in the intensive care unit or in the IC, in the theaters. Um, where do we use them very often in cardiopulmonary resuscitations? Um, the 5Hs and 5Ts, we have about 60, 60 to 70 percent of the 5Hs and 5Ts can be, can be recognized by using the bedside echocardiography, the tamponades, the hypovolemia, um, the, uh, the pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax, all this can be identified by bedside using of cardiac ultrasound. Um, the absence of the cardiac contractility following CPR will also help us in, in declaring the patient. Um, uh, patients with uh, who come with chest pain and hemodynamic instabilities, uh, by putting a eco, uh, echocardiogram on the echocardiograph, uh, we can be able to uh, uh, do get some differential diagnosis for for the chest pains. These acute aortic dissections, pulmonary embolisms uh, with th thrombus, pericarditis with pericardial effusion, etc. They also help us in weaning the patient from mechanical ventilation by looking at uh, uh, LV systolic functions, RV systolic functions. It can help us in usage of uh, vasoactive agents, use of diuretics, uh, use of uh, levosimendas, vasodilators, and so on. Um, it's role in ECMO. Uh, it's, uh, it helps in a proper positioning of the cannulas during the uh, during uh, insertion of the ECMOs. It also helps in in assessment for weaning. It, let it be V uh, uh, VA ECMO or V VV ECMO. The echocardiography has a role in weaning the patients from ECMO as well. Uh, there's something called as a false protocol. Um, 
uh, which uses both the lung ultrasound and the and the heart uh, ultrasound to uh, to come to diagnosis again in the intensive care units or um, or in the emergency room uh, one of our most important uh, uh, 650 to 60 percent of our patients come with shock with hypotension so to differentiate them and to treat them is very very important differentiating them from the four different kinds that's obstructive shock whether it's cardiogenic shock hypovolemic shock or distributive shock um, uh, the the uh, ultrasound machine um, with e either the lungs or the or the heart will help us in differentiating each of them like for example obstructive shock the patient might might have a um, pericardial tamponade uh, or a ventricular dilatation might might be having a pulmonary embolism which which will be able to diagnose quickly and treat it accordingly similarly cardiogenic shock uh, uh, looking at the uh, rv and lv functions uh, hypovolemic shock looking at the lv functions um, and also uh, distributive shock where you can look at giving uh, whether you need to give fluids or not fluid responsiveness these are the things that will help us in differentiating different kinds of shock um, eco uh, cardiogram has been as we said very commonly used in the icu as we said uh, that probably it's reached a time where every patient gets an eco eco echocardiography at uh, pro almost every day so uh, the competence of the users is very important and therefore there are multiple training programs that are happening uh, and i would request people to join them as well we have multiple uh, protocols like the the uh, courses like the race that is rapid assessment by cardiac echocardiography the fate like focused assess transthoracic echocardiography falls that is fluid administration limited by lung sonography there are multiple guidelines have come for us to help in hemodynamic monitoring in the ICUs. The main important questions that we need to answer while we're using echocardiography for monitoring is, uh, what is the left ventricular function? What is the right ventricular function? Whether there is evidence of any obstructive shock or what and what is the fluid status? Let's quickly go through them. Um, so left ventricular monitoring, uh, again, um, it is very important that we start with getting, when we're training, when we are initially learning echocardiography, it's very important that we obtain good quality images and interpret the echocardiography findings within the clinical context and not uh, fascinate about the, uh, the different numbers, about the Doppler study. It's very important that we just start getting the images right. That is a good beginning. And, the, and whenever we are using the echocardiography to see the left ventricle is mainly the size whether it's normal or not or whether it is uh, whether it is severely impaired or not uh, it can be if you get a good image it, uh, the uh, contractility of the heart can be quickly obtained by just eyeballing using uh, using any of the uh, four uh, basic views basic echocardiography views that is parasternal long axis parasternal short axis apical four chamber views or the subcostal views you, just by getting good pictures we we, uh, we can eyeball the left ventricle and look at the contractility and and diagnose and interpret a lot of things um, there are even the, the experienced users may supplement this information by by further assessment using a combination of fractional shortenings doppler patterns of ventricular filling and tissue doppler imaging as well and it is not it is very important to use several windows as no single view can provide a comprehensive picture of contractility. So these are the four basic views that we normally use in the intensive care units. Um, the, the first one being the uh, parasternal long axis view uh, where we can see the uh, left ventricle, right ventricle, right atrium and the, the left ventricular outflow obstruction the, the aortic aortic valve and the mitral valve here um, this is the subcostal view which is put below the ziphoid pro process you will be able to see again all the four chambers um, uh, the four chamber apical view you can see the left ventricle left atrium right ventricle and the right atrium along with the valves uh, and you can uh, during the systole you can see how the mitral valve is uh, uh, going towards the apex and uh, the diastole it comes towards the 
uh, towards the base. Again, this is a short axis parasternal view, which lets which uh, helps us in uh, looking at both the RV functions and the LV functions. These are the four basic views that we should be able to uh, 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 basic uh, as a basic echocardiography views of the and it helps in both left ventricle and right ventricle. Right ventricular function as well. Um, the assessment uh, has a very particular interest because of the fluid loading and also during the mechanical ventilation. Uh, due to the ventricular interdependence, impaired RV function can lead to uh, reduced left ventricular output as well. Okay, An interesting fact is that about 25% of the patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome can have right ventricular dysfunction along with pulmonary hypertension. Um, so, uh, similar to the left ventricle, we, we need uh, uh, the the function of the right ventricle is assessed by initially uh, by its size, uh, uh, by its wall thickness. Um, you can directly measure the RV size by the endocardial bo border tracing using using the different measurements that we have in our echo machines. Um, uh, or the subjective assessment of the right ventricular area. When compared to the left ventricular area in the apical four chamber view may be used as well. We need to understand that the RV, as we saw in the images, RV is usually is always smaller than LV in a normal state, and the ratio of end, uh, RV to LV and diastolic area is uh, is less than 0.6. And if it is more than 0.6, it usually indicates a dilated right ventricle consistent with either pressure or volume overload. The right ventricular wall is normally thin and hypertrophy. Um, um, and if, if it is hypertrophy, it indicates failure. Um, it can also be the contractility of the RV, just like the LV, can be assessed by eyeballing from the parasternal long axis view and also from the subcostal views. Uh, the most commonly used uh, uh, measurement on the, the transesophageal echocardiography is the TAPSI. Which, we call, uh, which is a tricuspid annular plane systolic ex excursion. If it is quite easily obtainable if you get a good image. And uh, um, so this is how you do the uh, TAPSI, that is a tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. Um, it's a linear M mode. So what you do is you get a four chamber, four chamber view and uh, uh, make sure you, uh, you uh, stress on the two chambers, the RV and the, and the RV. Uh, you put an M mode, align the cursor parallel to the uh, parallel to the lateral uh, tricuspid valve annulus, okay, and uh, press the uh, M mode, and you get diff different. You get the positive waves, okay. The difference between the dist uh, and the distance is measured. That is between the minimum and the maximum excursion. Okay, the value of less than 17 is usually suggestive of RV dysfunction. Okay, so TAPSI is something which we normally monitor as a, from the hemodynamic perspective in case of uh, echocardio echocardiography. So we looked at the LV, we looked at the RV, we also the uh, obstructive shock very commonly, pericardial, pericardial effusion leading to tamponade can be easily identified by using the uh, transthoracic echocardiography and transesophageal echocardiography, uh, it we can also guide our um, uh, pericardiosynthesis with the with the echocardiography as well the subcostal view. Okay, uh, another important thing that we commonly use the echocardiography for hemodynamic monitoring is fluid responsiveness. So, uh, uh, how do we dynamically monitor our hemodynamics, our, our fluid responsiveness. And, and um, I'm sure our uh, speakers before have explained the Frank Starling law based on that. The volume responsiveness typically means a 15% increase in the cardiac output with a fluid challenge of 500 mils. Um, in echocardiography, when we look at the fluid responsiveness, the most famous thing is the IVC diameters and IVC uh, diameter uh, uh, along with the di diameter, it is the index that that is quite important. That is the distensibility index, variability index. These are the two index which are uh, quite popular with mechanically ventilated patients with a tidal volume of about eight eight mils per kg. 
And the collapsibility index is what we use with spontaneously breathing patients. Okay, we use the subcostal subcostal view. Um, you uh, with the subcostal view identify um, identify the IVCs um, uh, and put the M mode probably one to two centimeter from uh, from the uh, entrance to the uh, to the uh, to the RA. Um, you, once you put the M mode, you get this view on the bottom. Okay, and then you calculate during the inspiration and expiration. You you calculate the uh, the diameter. Okay, you calculate the diameter. So the first one is the distensibility index. Distensibility index um, as a calculation, it is d max minus that is the maximum diameter uh, of the inferior vena cava um, uh, minus the minimum diameter uh, divided by the minimum diameter multiplied by the 100%. If a value exceeding 18% is predictive of fluid responsiveness in mechanically ventilated patients. Variability, is, variability index is another one where for this, in the same formula, the D max minus D min divided by D mean. The distensibility index was the, the minimum. Uh, here it is uh, the distance, the, the mean distance between the maximum and the minimum. If the value is more than 12%, it indicates a fluid responsiveness. Again, to note, variability index and distensibility index are mainly in mechanically ventilated patients who are not breathing spontaneously. While collapsibility index is some, it can be used in patients who are breathing spontaneously. Okay, so here it is uh, uh, DIVC expiration, that is the vena cava uh, the diameter during expiration, okay, or maximum D max minus D minimum, that is uh, uh, inferior vena cava diameter during the inspiration, that is minimum divided by the uh, uh, D maximum. Okay, that, uh, that uh, if that is more than 55%, uh, that means probably it is you have a dilated uh, IVC and probably it is not collapsing. If it is less than 55% collapsibility, probably the patient might uh, benefit by giving some fluids. So you can what you can do is you can um, keep the uh, keep the uh, probe in the in the subcostal view uh, uh, on time zero, and then you give some give the fluids. And see what happens uh, to the to the in, uh, to the indices. The, uh, this has this is quite commonly and it's commonly used and it's quite popular with the uh, with the uh, in intensive care doctors and uh, and also the emergency medicine doctors. Um, fluid responsiveness uh, can also be measured by uh, in a dynamic way by echocardiography v VTI. Okay. Um, uh, so for for to identify the VTI uh, or to measure the VTI, uh, you need a five chamber view. Okay, and this one is a, this is a five chamber view uh, where you have the right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium, right atrium, and the aortic aortic root there. Okay, you have the left ventricular outflow tract as well. First, identify that root. Uh, identify this view. Once you identify this view, have a pulse wave Doppler. Okay, pulse wave Doppler, at, uh, and the gate has to be placed. The this pulse wave gate has to be placed at the one or two centimeters from the left ventricular outflow tract above the iota. Okay, and then press the pulse wave Doppler button again for waveform tracing. And under your cardiac uh, advanced cardiac uh, measurements, you can opt the option for the measurement, and you can get the VTI value. Okay, so velocity uh, time integral or the VTI normally is between eighteen to twenty two. Uh, centimeters if this measurement is lower than 10 centimeters okay um, probably uh, he requires some fluid or there is an ivc collapsibility and in that case you can do what is called as a, a passive leg passive leg grazing test okay you do the passive leg grazing test where you get auto transfusion of 400 to 500 ml and see the change in the uh, change uh, in in the values if you see a change of about 10 to 15 percent from what was the baseline of the VTI, that means your patient is likely to be a, a fluid responder. Again, the, probably the last couple of slides is to uh, uh, how to calculate the cardiac output using the uh, using the echocardiography, which is already explained previously in, in the previous slide, where you get a parasternal uh, parasternal long axis view measure the left ventricular uh, outflow tract diameter okay 
um, uh, and uh, which normally should be about two centimeters if there is no valve pathology. Uh, it's be very. It, you need to get a good view here because um, if you change uh, the, it can if if you change the diameter or if you get a wrong value, then automatically your measurements will will be on the uh, uh, wrong side because because of the uh, because of the calculation there where you have pi r square uh, to calculate the to calculate the VTI. So this is a, uh, the this is the LVOT. LVOT diameter. This is this is where you calculate the LVOT diameter on with a parasternal view, parasternal long axis view. So because you have this square root here, the stroke the cardiac output is heart rate plus stroke volume. Stroke volume is pi r LVOT square into VTI LVOT. Okay, pi r square LVOT. Uh, the radius is what you have what you have measured multiplied by VTI LVOT, which is got from this. Uh, phi, phi chamber view and then by measuring the uh, VTF. So this is a small example where the heart rate is 82 diameter is about two centimeters and VTI is 20. How do you calculate the cardiac output? And then using this formula, stroke heart rate into stroke volume, stroke volume being pi r square into VTI LVOT, you get the cardiac output. So this is a non-invasive way of uh, measuring the cardiac output. So again, to conclude, uh, echocardiography is very very commonly used in the intensive care unit and every physician working in er uh, in the icu area or in the anesthesia room needs to get a hang of echocardiography you need to be competent in using using echocardiography it is a non-invasive technique um, uh, again there are multiple of, uh, 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 we are uh, dr murizar kanchi is is also running a echocardiography fellowship program so I would advise all of you to join the join the program and uh, learn it. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Arjun, for an elaborate uh, talk on hemodynamic uh, monitoring by echocardiography. Now I request uh, Ravi to introduce the next speaker. Hello, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Harish. Uh, he is a senior consultant and in charge of uh, medical intensive care uh, Narayana Health. He will be speaking on uh, hypotension prediction index. Dr. Harish, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, all. So this is one concept which is uh, uh, evolving in the last couple of years, maybe around like four or five years. That is hypotension prediction index. Uh, what we call it as HPI. So concept is very, very uh, good in terms of uh, troubleshooting aspect in the uh, perioperative, intraoperative patient so that uh, data is supported in terms of uh, helping in terms of reducing the morbidity and mortality. So maybe in another 12 to 15 minutes, we'll try to go through why it is important. So what monitoring device we can get this parameter called hypotension prediction index and what is its working principle and what is the evidence and what are the some sort of like limitations of using this hypotension prediction index. So I don't have any conflict of interest here. And so lots of like things we need to understand when it comes to hypotension and its outcome. So are we having a clear cut one criteria to define? Okay, so this is the hypotension and are we having any idea? Okay, so this particular blood pressure is going to cause some sort of morbidity in terms of increase in acute kidney injury, increase in perioperative uh, myocardial infarction or other organ dysfunction. So we have some sort of evidence for this to get an idea, okay, what level of blood pressure and how much duration of hypotension is having what kind of impact. So this is one published data in 2018. So intraoperative hypotension and the risk of postoperative adverse effect outcome. This is one of the systematic review and meta-analysis. So here, so they conducted a good systematic search, included many of the search engines and all. Finally, they included around 42 articles. If you see the data in terms of conclusion, the reported association suggests that organ injury might occur when a MAP 
decreases like less than 80 millimeters of mercury for more than or equal to 10 minutes and that this risk increases with blood pressure becoming progressively lower. So basically this is one of the systematic review which gives some idea. They accumulated all the data in the like intraoperative period and all. So if the map is falling less than 80 for about more than or equal to 10 minutes, so that they labeled it as a significant hypotension. So this is one more data to get an idea. Okay, so is there any relationship between intraoperative drop-in map and its clinical outcome after a non-cardiac surgery patients. Okay, so they excluded cardiac surgery patient. If you see, the data clearly suggests so lower mean arterial pressure so probability of acute kidney injury was very, very significantly high. If you see, there was a significant, some sort of like uh, correlation with increase in incidence of probability of the acute kidney injury when the map is around less than 50, less than 60 kind of this one. So till maybe around 60 to 70. So in and around, there was no significant increase in acute kidney injury. But once it dropped in and around 60, 65, there was a steep increase in onset of probability of the acute kidney injury. That was also true. So with that of the probability of acute myocardial injury. So this is one of the like study which tagged with that of the clinical outcome of intraoperative hypotension. So one more data, intraoperative hypotension is associated with persistent acute kidney injury after non-cardiac surgery. This is one again, multi-center core study. So intraoperative hypotension is associated with persistent but not delayed acute kidney injury. Even though it is an acute immediate kidney dysfunction, but it had a significant correlation with that of the hypotension which happened during non-cardiac surgery. See, what we need to understand. So I told, so if a patient had an hypotension, definitely outcome is bad. So what therapy currently we are practicing is what is something called as reactive like practice means like some event has been happened some insult has been happened then we are troubleshooting that like incident that is the hypotension so can we predict something okay so if you see the timeline with that of the corresponding performance so proactive domain of like troubleshooting very difficult to do always because it is something like which we are doing before the onset of event before the failure begins means patient is not having any prone for hypotension apparently we started norepinephrine apparently we given like volume loading and all that may not be always required in the intraoperative period but what we really need is something called like a predictive domain of our troubleshooting like before the onset or the before we have an like proper incident of hypotension so can we predict which particular patient is going to have that hypotension so that we call it as a predictive model of management and troubleshooting intraoperatively so this is what we exactly need so prediction of event we need to made here so that we can have some sort of like uh, therapeutic intervention and we can prevent the onset or the proper incident of that particular harmful like that is the hypotension so basically this gives some like immediate actioning so that we can prevent the organ dysfunction which is going to happen in the post-operative period so that is what we are narrowing down to our like concept of discussion that is called hypotension prediction index so here it is being developed with a machine learning and artificial intelligence so powered by a first of its kind algorithm that is with uh, some sort of modality of the monitoring device that is called Acumen IQ software. So accurately predicts hypotension 10 minutes before its onset. A hypotensive event has been defined according to this algorithm. When we have a map of less than 65 millimeters for a duration of at least one minute, that is what we like defined for this hypotension prediction index. So it is having some sort of unitless number which range from 0 to 100. So remember, very, very important. So higher the number means if the number is more towards 100, so higher is the probability and shorter is the time required for the hypotension to have some sort of its impact. Okay. So hypotension prediction index value is calculated every 20 seconds by using this Acumen IQ monitoring divide, device from that of the Edwards so on displayed on the monitor so for us it looks like so continuous hypotension 
prediction index, but it calculates at every 20 second. Very, very important. It gives some value between 0 to 100, more towards 100, more higher the probability of developing hypotension subsequently, and the duration required is very, very less to have that onset of the hypotension. So this is one thing we need to understand, as I already told, if you see the hypotension prediction index range, when we move towards like 95, 99, 90 to 94 and all, if you see the probability of the event percentage is increasing, it's almost 99.6 and the time required for the onset of that hypotension is going to be reduced to around 1.3 minutes. So remember, when we have a lowest value of hypotension prediction index, say 10 to 14, the probability of having the event is around 13.8%, maybe in an hour, that is around 51 minutes. So if you move to towards like 100 number. So less time is required for getting that hypotensive episode. So if you see this graphical representation, this is the trending of hypotension prediction index under of the mean arterial pressure. Wherever we have hypotension prediction index, which is moving towards value 100. So obviously they are having a significant map in the next one or two minutes. So if there is a reduction in hypotension prediction index, like below 100, more towards 50 and below and all. So map automatically increasing. So this is the correlation with that of the hypotension prediction index and the subsequent development of hypotension by using this acumen IQ that is from the Edward. So basically it is commercially available as uh, some sort of feature of EV1000 monitor device and Hemosphere clinical monitoring platform from the Edwards Life Science. So FDA has been approved this monitoring device since 2018 in India. We had this launched unit since July 2021 for the clinical utility of hypotension prediction index. We have two different methods. One is the non-invasive method that is Acumen IQ cuff. So which have some sort of incorporated algorithm to give some sort of hypotension prediction index. And we have a minimally invasive device where patient is having some sort of radial arterial cannula, we can use this Acumen IQ sensor. So this unlocks the Acumen hypotension prediction index software, automatically update advanced parameter every 20 second reflecting the rapid physiological changes in the patient. So basically this gives value every 20 second for, but for us, the monitor shows that of the continuous value of that hypotension prediction index. So Acumen hypotension prediction index software, it takes some sort of like complex incorporated algorithm. Okay. So it is a patent derived algorithm that is having some sort of software which takes around 2.6 million features from a single waveform which it then applies to around 133 million different waveforms looking for factors which can predict the hypotension so it is not so easy it takes multiple factors with a pre like entered data and it takes the data from that of the patient to give hypotension prediction index every 20 second so it's first fully approved for a into predictive analytics of the world of anesthesia. So till now, as we know that, so our action was reactive, but this is one of the modality where we can predict some sort of event and we can troubleshoot before the onset of hypotension. So when we put the monitor, so when we have some sort of alert, so this hypotension prediction index high alert is going to pop up like this. This is the Edward Life Science monitor device. So this is Acumen IQ. It gives like HPI value is 97 out of 100. So do you need more information? And are you sure that you are going to acknowledge this data and all? This is the first screen which we are going to get. So if the HPI parameter value exceed 85 for two consecutive 20 seconds, so R reaches 100 at any time, means single value of 100, or the values are more than 85 for two consecutive 20 seconds. So then we get HPI alert pop-up window. So prompting you to review the patient hemodynamics using HPI secondary screen. So what exactly the data we are going to get in the secondary screen, if you click on more information, so we are going to get the entire data of the hemodynamics of the patient. So including mean arterial pressure, cardiac output, cardiac index, systemic vascular resistance, okay, heart rate, stroke volume, stroke volume variation and pulse pressure variation. We know that these are the dynamic indices. So that 
like ratio we call it as arterial elastic means uh, uh, arterial elasticity and we get some data called dp by dt along with that of the hypotension prediction index here based on svv by ppv data based on dp by dt hypotension prediction index and the dynamic parameters like svv or that of the ppv we can do the whole thing of the troubleshooting whether we need to improve the contractility or we need to play around with the afterload increase or we need to give the fluid that is the preload. So these are the three parameters how we are going to troubleshoot when a patient we are going to predict is going to have the hypotension and all. So this is the hypotension prediction index screen that we got 94 out of 100. It is alerting. We got more information. I told the data of contractility we get by something called so maximum upslope of the arterial pressure waveform from a peripheral artery. Here we are using the radial artery. So that is the maximum up, up slope that we call it a systolic slope that is like pressure versus time ratio that we call it as a dp by dt so remember so maximum up slope of the arterial pressure waveform from this peripheral artery that is when we have a lower dp by dt indicates that we need to give some sort of therapy to support the contractility that is inotropic agent so we have hpi increased so we have some idea patient is going to have some sort of hypotension in the coming minutes. So then we saw the DP by DT, which tells if it is low, okay, which if it is low, so then it tells, okay, patient is going to have some sort of uh, like increased contractility and you need a some sort of inotropic agent, okay. So then what about other indices that is called as dynamic arterial elastin? So this is the ratio of like, as I already told PPV by SVV, so that tells about the afterload. We know that when it comes to increasing the blood pressure, so that is the mean arterial pressure, either we can play around with the cardiac output or you straight away constrict the peripheral vessels by increasing systemic vascular resistance. But we need to understand, so whether this particular patient needs fluid or like we can constrict the vessel to increase the blood vessel that we get by something called arterial pressure response to like this dynamic arterial elastin that is a PPV by SVV ratio. So optimal value should be one with a gray zone when we have 0.8 to 1.2 is taken into decision making. So the cutoff is like if patient is having a like EA dyne. So if it is more than 0.89, so then fluid alone increase the map may not be required to give some sort of vasopressor or vasoconstricting agents like that of the norepinephrine. If the value is less than 0.89, so we need some sort of some agent to constrict their vessels. So basically when we have like DP by DT low, we need to give some sort of inotropic agent. When we have a lower value, less than 0.89 of this EA dyne, so then we need to start some sort of norepinephrine to constrict the vessels, okay? So what about the indicator of preload? So we have a like high HPI and we have some sort of normal, say like DP by DT, and we don't want to constrict vessels because they are having a, an optimal or an increased EA dyne that is more than 0.89. So next step, we need to see the SVV. But remember, so SVV, PPV, they are having some sort of confounding factor. Patient should be having a tidal volume of 8 ml per kg. There should be, there should not be any severe restrictive lung disease or severe rised intra-abdominal pressure. There should not be severe RV dysfunction, sinus rhythm, well-controlled ventilation. There should not be any spontaneous effort. If any of these things are there, so then we can't use this SVV or PPV as a modality to get some idea about the predictiveness of volume responsiveness. Assume you negotiated all the confounding factors, then you see SVV or PPV kind of this one. We have a cutoff of somewhere around 10 to 12. If it is more than 12, okay, so then we have some sort of high probability of our particular patient will respond to volume that indirectly helps in improving his mean arterial pressure. So we have seen the parameter for afterload contractility that is DP by DT and we have seen the parameter for preload with an optimal condition that is SVV. So basically if you incorporate all these things how we can troubleshoot by using this acumen IQ hypotension prediction index. So patient undergoing elective non-cardiac surgery, this is one of the algorithm which has been used in the published data. Under general anesthesia, we got a HPI 
between 50 to 85 percent okay so advice is to diagnose the cause because we don't have too much concern of developing probability of the hypotension because fairly value is somewhere between 50 to 85 percent but if hpa is more than 85 percent or a map is less than already 65 means like already is in a hypotension so start treatment within two minutes we need to start troubleshooting so what we need to do so presence of more than our two criteria which mentioned below like the dynamic arterial elastance is decreasing okay so means ea dyne is low so systemic vascular resistance is decreasing means svr is low so he's having a significant peripheral vasodilatation is having a distributive shock because his svr is very very low and stroke volume variation is increasing means svv cutoff value is more than 12 percent and is in an optimal condition should satisfy for that believing of SVV or a PPV. Then the shock cause, the hypotension cause is vasoplegia, means is having a significant peripheral vasodilatation, significant like some sort of distributive shock. We need to start them on the norepinephrine. Okay. Suppose if the answer is no, then again any of the two below criteria more than or equal to two below criteria is dynamic arterial elastance is increased means ea dyne is more than 0.89 so stroke volume variation is increased svv is more with the adequate criteria satisfying means probably you need volume and stroke volume is also decreased means his cardiac output stroke volume is also less svv is more and that of his arterial elastance is also increased more than 0.89. Obviously, he need a volume that is the preload. Okay. Suppose if the answer is no. So then again, we can see presence of the three criteria below. Like is SVR equal or increase? So is systemic vascular resistance is constricted. Is SVR is very high. SVV is equal means it is not very high. Stroke volume is decreased. Means is having a low cardiac output. But because of the low stroke volume, low cardiac output as a compensatory mechanism, his vessels are constricted. His SVR is significantly high. So basically, there is no cardiac output is coming out because there is no problem with the volume status. With the optimal condition, SVV is normal. So if SVV is normal, the probability of fluid responsiveness by giving an external fluid or maybe an auto transfusion is very, very less because it is almost a normal with the optimal condition satisfied, then obviously the cause for the shock is poor contractility. So this is some fairly good acceptable protocol based on hypotension prediction index. But like even if you remember what need to be analyzed at the bedside, we can put all these things together. Okay, so one dynamic arterial elastance, DP by DT, SVV, SVR, stroke volume okay and to begin with what exactly is the hypotension prediction index value so based on this we can try to troubleshoot so hpi there are some data available we have a identified cutoff best cutoff of hpa of around 56 then we have a sensitivity of around 80 percent and specificity of 63 percent when we have hv hpi very low the lowest positive predictive value is around 10 percent for hypotensive events means if we have a hpi more towards 100 assume it is having a value of 85 then we have a very good negative predictive value of around 97 percent so ppv was too low to trigger hemodynamic intervention by clinician but is useful as an early warning signal. Means say HPI is 85 or more than that. So PPV is also elevated, then high probability he might require volume. Otherwise, he's going to have a hypotension. For HPI value of more than 98, the probability of an upcoming hypotensive event after in five to seven minutes was 64%. So which may generally be high enough to trigger adequate intervention. So potentially preventing this hypotensive episode. These are some of the published data. They try to correlate the value of HPI and the probability of development of the like hypotension in the subsequent minutes and all. So where does the evidence start? This is one of the paper which got published in JAMA. So in and around like around five to six years back. So effect of machine learning derived early warning system for intraoperative hypotension versus standard care and depth and duration of intraoperative hypotension during an elective non-cardiac surgery patient. So this is called hype randomized control trial. So clearly this single-centered 
preliminary data suggest patients who are undergoing elective non-cardiac surgery, the use of machine learning by using HPI by this Acumen IQ machine gives an early warning system in a better way in prediction of hypotension as compared to our standard modality. Means like, okay, patient had a tachycardia, so he might develop hypotension. Then going by this data, so this is an objective criteria which tells, okay, this particular patient is going to have a hypotension subsequently. So this is one more data. Again, so hypotension prediction index based protocolized hemodynamic management reduces the incident and duration of intraoperative hypotension in primary total hip arthroplasty. Again, non-cardiac surgery patient, single center data. So here it clearly suggests, so HPI algorithm combined with a protocolized treatment was able to reduce the incidence and duration of hypotensive event in patients undergoing primary hip arthroplasty. So good number of studies are available. So, but we need to understand there are some limitations. Still, we want some sort of robust data in terms of evidence in believing this hypotension prediction index. So hypotension events caused by clinical intervention. Say we have some sort of laparoscopic CO2 insufflation. So while manipulating the liver, vascular clamping or unclamping. So these were not included in the previous studies and all, but there are data ongoing to get some idea in these limited condition. Can we believe this HPI or not? We need to wait and watch. So the question of whether the algorithm can predict hypotension during induction of anesthesia, we need more and more data on this. The algorithm has been trained and developed based on the records of operating room and some minimal data in the post-operative ICU, that is the surgical ICU, but we don't have full-fledged validated data in like other surgical patients and all. So again, most of the data, they have some sort of particular mean arterial pressure that is less than 65. What happens when the map is between 65 to 75? We need more and more data on this, okay? So again, this is one more data. So ability of arterial waveform analysis derived HPI to predict future hypotensive event in surgical patient. So hypotension prediction index provide an accurate real-time continuous prediction of impending intraoperative hypotension before its occurrence and has superior predictive ability than the commonly measured perioperative hemodynamic variables. This is very recent 2020 anesthesia analysis data, so which tells, okay, in surgical patients, we can predict the hypotension by using HPI indices and all. So how we can approach, okay, in a simple way, based on hypotension prediction index, say HPI values approaching more towards 100, that is more than 85. So get a cardiac index. Anyhow, that acumen IQ gives a cardiac output and cardiac index value also. So if the value of cardiac index is normal, then see dynamic arterial elastins. As I already told, if it is very less, okay, so that is PPV by SVV ratio, then we need to constrict if the value is less than 0.89, give vasopressor, that is norepinephrine. If it is increased or normal, then we need to give fluid, okay, so to prevent the onset of hypotension subsequently. Assume cardiac index is low here, so then get an idea about the contractility, as I already told, dp by dt slope value gives an idea about the contractility if it is less straight away you can consider starting some sort of inotropic agent maybe a dobutamine if there is no significant already generated hypotension if it is increased or normal then see the value which helps in getting an idea whether we need to start vasopressor or not that is dynamic arterial elastins if it is low so with the background of high HPI, with the background of low cardiac index, then we need to maintain the perfusion pressure by constricting the vessels by giving an norepinephrine. So, but if it is increased, still we can consider volume to increase the cardiac index. Patient might be probably volume responsive. To conclude, so we know that hypotension is a common in critically ill patient, no doubt. So most of our intraoperative patient will have some sort of episodes of hypotension, even in the perioperative period and intraoperative period, has been some sort of significant adverse events, not only acute kidney injury or maybe myocardial injury and all, but it adds to the increased ICU length of stay, okay, hospital length of stay and to the overall cost. 
prolonged period of mild to moderate intraoperative hypotension is as bad as short period of severe hypotension remember so we neglect okay map is just 60 so we can like just wait and watch so if that period got prolonged like less than 60 55 58 mean arterial pressure and all that is having a equipotent effect in terms of perfusion of the vital organs when we have a short duration of the severe hypotension when map is less than 50 less than 45 and all so so far we were following reactive rather than a proactive management of intraoperative hypotension so need of the hour is we need some preventive predictive strategy to get some idea so this particular patient will have hypotension subsequently so basically this is like a butterfly effect so which has created the ripple but its impact is significant it spreads throughout the stay of the patient so if you are going to prevent this disturbance here so then we can like predict the hypotension and its sequelae so one method of like Preventing that butterfly uh, ripple effect is by using this hypotension prediction index. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harish, for the excellent presentation. Uh, Dr. Morley, over to you. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. All the speakers have done very well, and uh, I really enjoyed the talks. Thank you so much. And I request all the speakers and moderators to keep the mics on and uh, videos on for the question answers. Please unshare the screen, Dr. Harish. And uh, to start the discussion, uh, the, uh, I'll go through the chat box first. Finger cuff cardiac output be affected by hypothermia. This question goes to, I think, uh, Dr. Madhu, you presented on. Uh, Cardiac output, can you uh, take up this question? What is the effect of hypothermia on finger cuff cardiac output? Uh, yes, sir, sure. Uh, as a finger cuff method, it is based on the vascular unloading technique. Hypothermia will lead to vasoconstriction and finger yeah. cuff method is likely to be inaccurate due to hypothermia. I think I agree with that. Any, any other comment on that response? Everybody agrees on that? Uh, next question is what is the effect of PEEP on PA pressures? Um, this will go to Nishan because he was talking about PA pressure. What is the effect of? Yes, sir. Um, sir. Hello. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Um, so usually uh, PEEP is applied in uh, um, see the clinical scenarios where there is hypoxia. So with the application of PEEP, uh, the oxygenation will improve resulting in a reduction in the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, there, thereby reducing the pulmonary vascular resistance. Another thing PEEP will do is it will increase the functional residual capacity. So yeah. the effect of PEEP on uh, the pulmonary vascular resistance is actually a bimodal. So when we apply PEEP, uh, the alveoli will expand and that will cause um, the vaso, uh, the constrictions of the intra-alveolar vessels. Uh, this will also increase the lung, val or lung uh, volume. So if uh, the intra-alveolar vessels are compressed, lung volume is increased, the pulmonary vascular resistance will increase. If the intra, uh, uh, if the alveolar pressures uh, doesn't increase to that extent, the pulmonary vascular uh, resistance will decrease. So this will depend on where the uh, tip of the catheter is. So in the west zone three, uh, the alveolar pressures are the lowest compared to the venous pressures and the arteriolar uh, pressures. So in that case, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and the pulmonary arterial pressure, especially the diastolic pressure, will is a will be a good indicator of the uh, left atrial pressures and uh, left ventricular and diastolic pressures. However, with increase in PEEP, the west zone 3 can get converted into west zone 2. That is the pulmonary alveolar pressures can overcome the pulmonary uh, venous pressure. Uh, uh, in that case, uh, pulmonary capillary pressure will not accurately pre uh, predict the uh, left uh, uh, arterial pressure, left atrial pressures or left ventricular and diastolic pressure. I, I agree with all the points you mentioned. Very well done. Actually, 
uh, we when you apply physiological P for five centimeter, we think uh, we usually take it that uh, there is no effect on the pulmonary artery pressure. But anything greater than five millimeter, uh, five uh, centimeters of water P would affect the PA pressure as described by you. If the patient is already hypoxemic by increasing the PaO2, it might uh, actually reduce the PA pressure. But in normal circumstances, any P applied increases the resistance intra-alveolar, I mean, the resistance in the pulmonary vasculature and increase the pulmonary arterial pressure. But what happens in patients with pulmonary hypertensive crisis, especially in children, if you apply um, PEEP, the actually pulmonary artery pressure uh, decreases because of the improvement of the oxygenation. And also we have to keep in mind that the best zone to measure the pulmonary artery pressure is zone three. And by application of uh, pulmonary PEEP, you can convert the best zone three to two, two to one like that. Thank you for that. And any responses on this? Anybody else uh, wants to add any point on this? We go on to the third question. Uh, how do you correct under damped system? I think this uh, Saujanya has to answer this. Saujanya, uh, uh, the question is, so if there is uh, under damped arterial trace, what do you do? So uh, basically under dampening, uh, the most common cause is uh, very long stiff tubings that we connect between uh, art line and uh, our uh, transducer, sir. So we, we should try to minimize uh, as good as possible. We should try uh, to uh, keep uh, short tubings, a uh, little bit compliant tubings, and uh, we should uh, see the pressure in the flashback sir it should be adequate between 250 to 300 mm hg and we should avoid putting uh, excessive stop cocks between the long stiff tubing and the transducer which increases the resistance and we should look for any air bubbles in the stiff tubings and uh, finally uh, we we should also relate to the systemic vascular resistance of the patient, sir. If the systemic vascular resistance is too high, then the compliance of the arterial system is uh, very low. So it will also give non-physiological os oscillations in the dichrotic limb. So the last maneuver will be uh, after ruling out all this uh, uh, structural uh, this thing in the system, the last maneuver will be altering the patient's systemic vascular resistance. Everybody agrees uh, to this. Uh, can all the parts of uh, the faculty members keep their mics on and uh, videos on? We'd like to see you on the screen. Uh, do you agree with what is said? We should go for a stiff tubing, not a compliant tubing. Compliant tubing will swell up with the pressure oscillations and oscillations are magnified. So we should go yeah, for a basically a shorter. Shorter, wider. We have to go for a stiffer right. tubing. Yeah. We'll go to the next question now. What is the concerns of for epidural for hepatectomy? Who will answer this? CVP. Who was doing CVP? Such, uh, Sushruta? Uh, hello, sir. What do you do with uh, epidural in hepatectomy? Will you give epidural for hepatectomy? So yes, so intraperioperative analgesic requirement will be less. Um, IV analgesic requirement will be less. And uh, keep your so can... video on. Uh, anyway, please continue with the answer. Yes, sir. Yeah, you would like to be epidural for hepatectomy because it's a pay. It's a then it will be a... surgery. So you, especially if it is open uh, hepatectomy. We yes, have to sir. do epidural and epidural reduces CVP. That's actually added advantages in the cases yes, because you want to do CVP on the lower side to improve the surgical uh, uh, facility. Really? Uh, it gives a optimal surgical feel when you keep the CVP low. That's the reason why, you, uh, if possible, give a epidural for these patients. We'll go on to the next question. And uh, one more thing, sir. Epidural. Sorry. It basically, the surgeon should be convinced that the epidural 
is the best. Some surgeons they will have concern about the uh, hypertension. No, you have to, you should not allow this pressure to fall down. Yes, the, any uh, hypertension, no, they will put the blame on uh, epidural. <laughs> so they should be convinced that uh, it will not cause even in the post-operative period. It is uh, like uh, can be commonly used. There is no contraindication for uh, like routine use. Uh, so can I say that uh, you have to balance out the blood pressure and CDP and use the epidural judiciously? Judi I mean, um, not judiciously. Uh, you can, you should use the epidural, but take care of the blood pressure and keep the CDP low. That's fine. Can I make? Can I make a comment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. sure. This uh, he he's right. Uh, Shivananda is right because yes. the surgeon, especially in the post-operative period. If you have an epidural for pain control, mm -hmm. the anesthesia team has to monitor the epidural. And Absolutely. we had a patient that had GYN surgery, oncologic surgery, and oh. she was bleeding internally and was getting hypotensive. Mm -hmm. And they were saying, it's the epidural, it's the epidural, it's the epidural. Uh, the problem was that we did not have an active uh, anesthesia team monitoring the patient. So they kept blaming it on the epidural till the patient arrested and had to be taken to the operating room because then the belly was distended and they found it's from bleeding. So when you do epidurals, you require Absolutely. closed monitoring by the anesthesia team. Absolutely, you have to take care of the blood pressure right. aspects and monitor the patient and find out the reason for hypotension if it occurs. Correct, correct. So Sivananda is very right. Yes, yes. Thank you for that uh, comment, and we'll go on to the next uh, question on uh, do you do a ECG during PSA and what changes in it should be worried? Uh, I don't know who will answer that. Uh, doing ECG during PSA. Uh, see, ECG for PSA during PSA is done if there is uh, history of cardiovascular disease or risk uh, cardiovascular risk factors are present or the patient is symptomatic from cardiac point of view or any patient in India, at least uh, any patient who is above the age of 40, 45, you would like to have ECG because of the rampant coronary artery disease and uh, any abnormality in the ECG must be thoroughly investigated uh, and uh, usually echocardiography is uh, Easily available in most centers, and we should get the echocardiography done and then find out why the ECG is abnormal and then carry on with that. Does everybody agree with that uh, response? Yes, sir. Thank you. Then, next question is uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Baljit is available. I would like to thank all the speakers, uh, they have done excellently well. So, Sojanya, Shishrita. Madhu, Nishant, Arjun, and Harish. And I would like to thank my co-chair, uh, Shivananda, Raghu, and uh, Ravi Nayak for being with me. And I hand over the mic to Dr. Uh, Baljit. Is there? Yeah, I'm certainly there. Dr. Baljit, please join us. Thank you so much for having me. I should over. thank you for being with us. <laughs> I was very patiently listening to all the, uh, you know, uh, the, the questions and the uh, way the people were handling their questions, uh, explaining very well to the satisfaction of the uh, to ask. Well, uh, once we come to the end of a uh, very interesting webinar, uh, the one forty second uh, webinar that we had, and uh, this, uh, you know, was on hemodynamic monitoring, which is, uh, you know, of course, very essential in all major surgeries, whether they are cardiac or non cardiac or any uh, major surgery procedures. And I thank all the speakers for the wonderful uh, presentation that they had, starting with uh, Dr. Aluri uh, uh, Sojanya. Yes. Dr. Sushita Sahu, Dr. Nishant on pulmonary IT catheter, Dr. Madhu Nishant uh, on cardiac output, uh, Dr. Arjan Alwa on yeah. and uh, Dr. Harik <laughs> uh, on hypotension. And of course, uh, as usual, uh, excellent moderation by Dr. Uh, Muriya Kanchi, the dean uh, nationally that we have, uh, is very senior, very experienced, and very learned uh, faculty from Narayana Rudalia. 
and he was very well supported by Dr. B. Raghu, Dr. Shivananda, and Dr. Ravi Nair. Well, friends, uh, uh, we are coming to the end of this, and uh, on behalf of Indian College of Anesthesiologists, I thank you all, uh, speakers, uh, of course, and uh, all the participants in this webinar. Uh, and of course, uh, I thank Leonard also for uh, you know, for their assistance in, uh, in conducting these webinars. So tell Thank me you, Baljit. I would like to thank Belani also. He has joined sure. and his input was valuable. Thank you so much. It must be very early morning over there and I think it must be very hard time for him, uh, you know, to, to get up uh, early and then attend the webinar. Thank you so much, yeah. Dr. Belani. We appreciate your presence and not just appreciate your presence, your active participation in this. And, uh, it was an excellent, uh, excellent webinar. The speakers were high quality. Yes, and uh, enjoyed uh, learning from all of them. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, so you much. So much. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Good Thank good you good so good much and good night. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, all the doctors. Thank you so much. Thank you, Clint. Thank you, Arjun. Thank you, Arjun.